All right, good morning, everyone. And we're glad to uh, have you. Some of us are meeting live as we record this, and some of you will be watching this later. But uh, whether you uh, are watching us live or not, we are grateful and we thank you for being with us. Uh, today, I want to talk about our works. Will our works save us? And the verse that we have under consideration is Galatians 3, verse 10. We'll talk about that here in a few moments. But at the very outset, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And I want you to think about these. And I'll give you just a couple of moments to think about these. Uh, number one, what I would like you to do is give, just answer this uh, in your own mind. But give three to five reasons why you think you will go to heaven. And they don't have to be long, just say because of this, 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 you know, just something real short. I'll give you just a moment to think about why you should uh, go to heaven, why you think you will. We might even think what it would take for you to go to heaven. So are you thinking about it or you, have you come up some, with some reasons why you think you'll go to heaven or what you would need to do maybe to go to heaven? All right. The second thing, I want to ask you another question or another assignment here. I want you to think of someone that you know really well. You knew really well. Maybe they've died. They, they passed away. And I want you to... I want you to think of someone you think if you thought somebody saved, it's probably them. And so I want you to think about that and give three to five reasons why you think you believe that they are saved and they are in heaven right now. might be your mother or your father who's passed away and you think they were really good people. If anyone's in heaven, it's them. Might be someone you knew in a church or something. Why do you think they're in heaven if you think they're in heaven? All right, we'll get back to that, God willing, later, but Last Lord's Day, we talked about the righteousness of God, and we saw that it is apart from works of any kind on our part to be right with God. And we saw that righteousness, the righteousness of God is a righteousness that we don't obtain by trying to keep God's law. We saw that it's a righteousness that becomes ours, not by uh, our efforts to obey God and to do good deeds. It's apart from the law. That's what that means. It's not by works that we do. It's to the exclusion of any works that we do of any kind. But it was God's right. It's God's righteousness. Well, I want to continue that theme today in this lesson. And uh, I want to look at a few passages and talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, we begin by uh, showing that this is supported in many places in God's word. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace. Now, grace means you get a gift, you get something freely given to you that you didn't work for, you didn't earn it, you didn't even deserve it, you just received it. It's by grace that you have been saved, Paul says, through faith. And he says, it's not of yourselves. It's a gift. That's what grace is. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And again, we read in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Paul said, God saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, nothing that we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace 
This grace was given. That's what grace is. It's always something that's given to us. He said this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So we're seeing in these verses that this is supported in many places. You're not saved by your works. It's a gift of God. It's not by works. You see these underlines there. It's not by works. Look at Paul in Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 7. He said, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. How? Not because of any righteous things we had done. We're not saved by anything righteous that we do. If you obey God, that's righteous. But we're not saved because of anything righteous that we've done. He said, but because of his mercy, so that having been justified, that means you've been saved. You, it's just as if you've never sinned. You're right in God's sight is literally you have a right standing with God. We have been given this right standing. We've been justified by how? By his grace that we might become heirs, uh, having the hope of eternal life. And, and you just see this everywhere in um, Romans. This passage here, as I've told you in the past, if you've heard me preach, I think this is the greatest passage in all of Scripture. But Paul says this so many times in Romans. He says that, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, not your righteousness, it's a righteousness of God. He said, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we receive it. And it's a gift of God. And he said, uh, it, he says it is given through faith. You see that over and over again. That's how you get the righteousness of God. You receive it as a gift through, by faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says again, to all who believe, it's available to everybody who believes. He says all are justified freely by his grace. And if you hear me preach, you'll hear me talk about this verse because it's wonderful. The word freely there is the same word that's translated in John 15, 25, without a reason, without a cause. Jesus said, they hated me without a reason. They didn't have any cause to hate me. They didn't have any reason. And that's what happens when you're a follower of Christ as well. They hated him without a reason. Well, here he says, we're all justified without giving God a reason. Without giving him a cause, we have been made right, justified with God. And he said it's, and then he piles on, he says, by grace. Well, that's basically saying the same thing. All, he says, are justified freely by his grace. God presented Christ. He did something. He presented Christ as a sacrifice to be received by faith. And God, he goes on to say, justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so you can see that scripture supports this over and over again. It, we are saved. We have a right standing with God on the basis of grace, a free gift. And Paul would say in verse 27 of Romans 3 here, the next verse, he says, so that no one can boast. But if you look at that first verse up there, Ephesians 2 uh, verses 8 and 9, he says, it's so that no one can boast. You see, we don't play any part. We, we haven't done a thing to earn our salvation, get this right, right standing with God. Uh, if we did any, if we had any part in it, we could boast about what we had a part in. But it's, it's, it's all of grace. It's a complete gift. It's something we don't give God a reason or a cause. Now, my question to you today is, do you understand this? I, I, I don't want to take for granted that people who've gone to church all their lives understand this. If you were raised like me, um, I really worry whether you understand this at all. We sang this in some songs. This is the live service for those of you who are watching this later. We sang this in Rock of Ages. We sang this in some other songs uh, that it's all of grace. It's a gift and it's received by faith. And this is said over and over. This is emphasized in God's word. Do you understand? that we receive right standing with God without 
any of our works of any kind, that if anybody seeks to be justified or made right with God any way other than is freely given to us without a reason or cause by his grace, that you are without hope. You are lost. You're damned. There's no hope for you if you think you're saved in any other way than what God is pointing out here. If you look to anything that you are, if you look to anything that you do as a basis of your justification, your right standing with God, whether in part or in whole, I used to preach when I was raised in this denomination I was raised in that, you know, 99% of it's God, but 1% of it's us. Well, no, nothing. If you think you are saved in part or whole by what you do, that you will be eternally damned to hell. Your faith is not in Christ alone. You don't have saving faith. This is the most important thing that you will ever understand in all your life. Now, the question I want to get to today is, why? Um, why is it that our works, works of God's law cannot save us, they cannot make us right with God? Well, I want to look at this verse that we put in the title. This is the verse I want to look at. This is why we can't be justified by anything that we do. Look at this. Paul says, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, I want you to notice these words. He says, first of all, cursed is everyone. Everyone who does not continue to do everything written in God's law is under a curse. And then he says that cursed is everyone who uh, does not continue. You see, you have to do this 24-7. You have to keep all of God's law perfectly all of the time. In, in deed, in motive, in attitudes, we must continue to do everything written in God's law or we are cursed. And then he says, we must continue to do it. We must actually do God's law. Everyone who does not continue to actually do it, everything in God's law is under a curse. It's, it's actual obedience. It's not just intending to do them or sincerely trying to do them. That's the way a lot of people think. They think, well, God sees that I'm sincere and I'm really trying. But no, you're under a curse if you don't actually do them. You have to actually do them, everything in God's law, or you're under a curse. And then everything. You have to do everything in God's law. You have to continually, 24-7, everybody has to, has to continually, perpetually do, actually do it, not just have good intentions, everything. Not just like baptism, let's say, well, I was baptized and I go to church. No, you got to do everything. If you're going to be justified by what you do, you got to keep every command perfectly, not just baptism. You see, everyone has to do everything or else they're under a curse. And then the last part of this, what? He says, they're cursed. A curse is on every single person, you see, because everybody has to do this, who does it perfectly and continually actually do every single solitary thing written in God's law. That's a very important passage. And it's a passage people need to consider very carefully. That's why I'm preaching it today. Here's what Paul would say in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nobody who's done, uh, continually done everything, actually done it perfectly and isn't under a curse. Paul, Paul says everybody's sinned. Here's what he says in another passage. And what should we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not of all. We have already made the charge. He's summing up three chapters here. 
that Jews and Gentiles, that's non-Jews, alike are all under the power of sin. And then he quotes some passages from the Old Testament to further prove this. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then in verse 20, in this passage, he goes on to say, therefore, no one, no one will be declared righteous in his sight um, by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So I want you to look at Paul's point right here. Number one, the law of God, you see, if it means, um, uh, if, it's, if you think it's the means by which we are seeking to be justified by God, in fact, it does nothing but condemn us and put us under a curse, and it curses us to hell. Why? Because God's law requires perfect, universal, perpetual obedience to everything, actual obedience, not sincere or intended obedience, to everything that his law commands. And those who fail to render this perfect obedience, continual obedience, are under a curse. Therefore, Paul says here, everyone who relies on the, their works to save them is under a curse. Why? Because we've all failed to do what God's law requires. And that's the point that he's making here. That's the point that he's making in these verses that I've quoted below. But someone says, well, our works have some part in our right standing with God, at least a part. God doesn't really require from us perfect, perpetual obedience. Nobody could do that. So God doesn't require that. He only requires sincere effort. We in, in, intend to obey, even if we don't do it perfectly. Well, that's not what the text says. Listen, cursed is everyone, and Paul says in other places, all of sin, uh, who does not continue, this is all the time, perpetually, to do, to do, actually do, every single thing that God commands. And if you don't, you're under a curse. That's the teaching. That's the teaching of this Galatians 3, verse 10. And, um, and it's not just the teaching of this text, but it's a really good text. You see, God's law, by its very nature, um, demands that we keep all of his commands. God is always required for every single command. When he gives us a command, he is always required. Perfect, perpetual, actual continuous obedience by everyone or you're under a curse. Let me give you a few verses, Old Testament. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 24, but if a righteous man uh, turns from his righteous uh, deeds and he commits and does some of the detestable things that a wicked person does, he said, will that person live? He says, none of the righteous things that that person has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness um, they are guilty uh, uh, of, uh, and because of the sins that they have committed, they will die. You see, here's a person, a righteous person, and he commits one sin, and now he's guilty. Look at James chapter 2 and verse... Um, 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. The law is so interconnected that when we disobey one command, we actually wind up disobeying all of them. Think of a chain. You're hanging by a chain that has 10 links in it over a cliff, thousands of feet above the ground. And one link uh, breaks and down you go. And any violation of God's law in thought, in word, or deed is defined by sin in God's word. And it is never okay to sin. 
every sin is deserving punishment. And for anyone that says, well, God's law requires less than it requires, is actually saying that um, uh, God's law doesn't require what it requires. When, when God says you shall not murder, what he really means is you should sincerely try real hard not to murder or, or don't murder too much. When he says don't steal, what he really means is you should try real hard not to make that your habit or not to steal too much or um, uh, try real hard not to do it. Even though you may steal sometimes, that's okay as long as it is generally your habit not to steal and you sincerely intend not to steal, that's the main thing. Or when God says, you shall not covet or lust, what he means is try real hard not to do that or don't do it too often. No. When God says you shall not do something, he means you shall not do it ever, any time, not even one time. And when God says you shall do something, he means you must do it all the time when duty requires it. When he commands us not to be envious or jealous or have unrighteous anger in our hearts, he doesn't mean, well, just don't do it too much. You see, when he says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, he doesn't mean that literally. He just means make a sincere effort at it. No, when God says you shall not do something, he means you shall not do it ever at all not even one time. And when God says you must do something, you must do it always and perfectly every single time duty requires it perfectly. And so when God commands us, the greatest two commands, love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, love our neighbors, ourselves. to ever fail to do that one time is sin. And it is never okay to sin. The soul that sins will die. And Paul would say uh, also that the wages of sin is death. You see, every rule, by the way, not just God's rules, not just God's laws, every rule everywhere uh, requires perfect conformity to itself. It's a contradiction to suppose otherwise. To say that there is a law somewhere that doesn't require perfect obedience to it is to say that there's a law that doesn't require what it requires. Now, we know that we as believers, we don't keep God's law perfectly. We sincerely as believers try to keep God's law. But you see, our sincere efforts to render perfect obedience to God can't justify us. Because God's law requires perfect obedience. And if we are to be justified on the basis of anything we do, then we must keep God's law, all of it, perfectly, sinlessly, inward, outward, actually doing it, or we're under a curse. Now, do you see what Paul is teaching here? And this is, and by the way, you can be saved. You, you, you can be saved by keeping God's law. You say, well, you've been saying here several times you can't. Well, I want to show you, you, you really can. Uh, here's what Paul said in Romans 2, verse 13. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin uh, under the law will be judged by the law. And um, he goes on to say that um, I, have, I wrote down the wrong verse there. But he says in Romans 2, verse 13, it's not those, the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law who will be saved. You know what the point he's making there is? You got it. Yeah, you can be saved by doing God's law, but you better keep it perfectly because he says in many, many other places, no one will be justified by keeping God's law. But in that place, he says, yeah, it's not just the hearers of the word. You have to actually do it to be justified. But he says over and over in Galatians in 3 and Ephesians, we read in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 and, and other places that no one's ever done that. But that's how you're going to be judged 
you're going to be judged by a perfect law whether you and whether you've kept that perfect law perfectly. You see, we're not, we can't just be advocates of God's law. We can't merely admire God's law. Uh, it's not, uh, we can't merely uh, make a sincere effort to keep it. We must be perfect doers of God's law, all that God's law requires to be justified by works. And so, again, like I said, let's be reminded of the insufficiency of anything but a perfect obedience to make us acceptable to God. What we need is a perfect obedience. And you say, that's bad news, Jimmy. Well, it, it sure is. It, it's bad news. If that's the case, you might say, well, I'm lost. I'm doomed. I'm damned. I'm hopeless. Yes, that's right. You are hopeless. You are damned. You are hopeless, that is, apart from the good news message of the gospel. And that's what Paul, all, look at all these verses, Old and New Testament, and there's many more. That's what Paul and all these people are getting at. You have to have a perfect obedience to be accepted and right with God. And it's what you don't have. No one else has. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So look at all these verses again. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. 2 Timothy 2. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. He has saved us and called us uh, to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his mercy and grace. It's this grace, he says, has been given us in Christ Jesus. And look at, again, Titus 3, 5 and 7. Not because of we're saved as he saved us, not because of righteous things that we've done, because we've all sinned. And we have to keep it perfectly, and we haven't done that. But we, he says he saved us, uh, having been justified by his grace. If we're going to be right before God, it's going to have to be given to us as a gift. Because you and I haven't kept it. Nobody's kept God's law perfectly. And um, look at um, this passage again. It's apart from the law. You see, apart from our law keeping, there's a righteousness of God. This righteousness of God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. All are justified. How are we made right with God? Justified freely without giving him a reason by grace. God did something. God presented Christ as a sacrifice. And all of this is received by faith. God justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So you can see this is really, really uh, good news. The good news of the gospel is that God doesn't somehow ignore perfect, continual, perpetual, actual obedience to be right with him. He doesn't just say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lower my standard, and I'm going, going to accept just a little bit less than that. As long as they're trying, you know, they're, look at them. They're really trying. And they're really nice people like them and they go to church. And, and so I'll accept them into heaven. That's not what he does. God doesn't cast aside the requirement of perfect righteousness and obedience. I have known wonderful young people. They go to church and people say, well, Jimmy, look at those people. They are so sweet and nice. They're late teenagers, and look how kind and sweet and nice they are. And they go to church, and, and you know, I could show you Muslims, Muslim girls. They're just so nice, so sweet. I've met them, just the kindest, nicest people, very committed to the Muslim face. you got Jewish young people. I could, I've experienced them, just the nicest people. They go to the Jewish synagogue. I could show you Mormons, young people, teenagers that are just so nice, helpful, and sweet. 
You see, you can, you can see that in all these religions. But here's the problem. They're not saved because they're nice. You say, yeah, they go to a false religion. You're not saved because of anything good you do. That's the point. We're saved rather because of what God did. God himself provided for us in Christ what he has also demanded from us and that what we don't have, but we must have. Christ, the sinless one, was acting in our behalf. He was, he was the last Adam. He's our representative, you see. The first Adam was our representative before we get into Christ. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. He's our representative. And his perfect sinless righteousness, everything that he accomplished, he actually earned. And he credits it to our account when we take God at his word and we receive this gift of grace. You see, we come to Jesus. The only thing we contribute to our salvation is our sin. We put our trust in him alone, in grace, a gift to us alone for the only hope of our acceptance before God. Jesus Christ was justified on the basis of works. He did keep every single thing continually, perfectly, actually did it all of the time. And so he never was under a curse for his, his own sins, but God made him a curse for us. You see, God put our sins in his account, 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5, verse 21, he made him who didn't have any sin to be sin for us. Our sins were credited to his account, even though he was perfectly and hit perfect in his righteousness, he says, was credited to us so that we could become what? The righteousness of God. It's God's righteousness that we needed, that we didn't have, but we received by faith. It's a righteousness that's not our own personally. We didn't earn. We couldn't earn. If we did earn, we could boast about it, but it's credited to us by grace and it's received by faith in Jesus Christ alone, no other way. That's the good news. My friends, I'm telling you, I do not get tired of this. That is the good news of the gospel. You doing your best or going to the right church and doing church right, that is not good news at all. That just condemns you to an eternal hell. Because if you aim to be justified by your works and doing things right, then you better keep all of it. You're putting your trust, if you put your trust in anything you are, anything you've done, what your church stands for, being in the right church, you are eternally damned. Our faith must be in the work and life of Jesus Christ alone. And, and so listen to these songs that we sang in our worship a few minutes ago. Listen to these words. He said, um, and, and these are a couple of other verses that I, that I would like to refer to maybe a little later, but he says, uh, it's through the obedience of one man that we've been made righteous. Not your obedience, Christ's obedience. He says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, Christ is our righteousness. Look at these songs, Rock of Ages. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. You cannot keep God's law. You haven't kept it all the sin. And the labors of your hands cannot make you right with God. That's what we just sang a few minutes ago. You must say, you alone, not mainly God. No, God alone. Verse three, nothing in my hand I bring. I don't have anything to offer God to be right with him. Nothing in my hand I bring. It's simply to the cross I cling. Helpless, look to thee for grace. It has to be a gift. You remember the publican up on the temple mount in, in Luke 18. He smote upon his breast and he said, God, pacify your wrath. That's literally what he said, the word he used. Pacify your anger against me. 
because he knew that he didn't have anything that in himself to pacify God's wrath that was justly against him. He had sinned. All he had was his sins. Now, I want to ask you today, do you want this righteousness? Do you desire to be made right, justified right now and forever and on the last day when you die? Well, I'm urging you to come to Christ today in faith. You can be saved right now when you put your trust and confidence in him alone for your salvation. Come in all your filthy rags. Bring nothing but your sin and your unworthiness. You need no righteousness of your own. God demands a perfect, spotless, continual, actual righteousness and obedience. That's true. But in yourself, you don't have it. You have no righteousness to make you acceptable before God. And if you tried for a million, million years, you never would. But now there's a righteousness from God apart from law keeping which is received by faith. Everyone who believes can get this. It's freely given without us giving him any reason, any cause. It's given to us as a gift, a gift of grace. God has freely, without us giving him any reason, he's provided what he demands. He's provided as a free gift to us. Run to Jesus and be clothed in his righteousness. And then we go back to those verses that I had up there um, earlier. For just as through the disobedience of one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, he says, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. Uh, by the way, look at that verse again and see how much of your righteousness is in there. It's through the obedience of your righteousness. Is it Jesus' righteousness and your righteousness? What, what did Paul say there? Is it your righteousness? Is that how you're made righteous? And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, he says, Christ is our righteousness. Give yourself entirely to, to Jesus as your Lord, the Lord of your life and your savior, he to be governed by him, to be owned by him. Let him be your righteousness. And like the tax collector, I'll tell you what happened in that story. Did you know that when he did this, Jesus said he went home justified as if he had never sinned, you see. And for those of us who are believers, and this is another song that we sang earlier in our worship service, service nothing but the blood of jesus nothing but the blood of jesus no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus for my pardon this i see what my righteousness no nothing but the blood of jesus nothing but the blood of jesus nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of jesus listen to this verse three not of good that i have done your good works don't undo your sins. And the wages of sin is death. But it's not of good to anything we've done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's a wonderful song. It just says it over and over again. I used to sing that song all the time. Didn't even believe it. And for us who are believers, we need this. We This is good news. You know, Paul, when he wrote in... Uh, Romans and Galatians especially, he didn't write to unbelievers. He wrote to believers. We need to come back to this over and over again. He didn't write to uh, even the theological professors at some seminary. He wrote to common believers like you and me. I used to think the good news message was really only for unbelievers. You know, it's for the lost. It was just the ABCs of Christianity. And then when I came to know the grace of God and, and studied Galatians and understood that I'm saved by grace and not by anything that I do. And then I began to see, you know, the gospel is that not only the ABCs of Christianity, it's the A to Z of Christianity. Everybody needs to come back. It's an eternal gospel, by the way. Those of us who are saved eternally, this will be the good news that we will hear over and over again. But 
um, there's another reason why nobody will be made right or justified by God's law. And this reason is because of this, because God's law can't justify anybody. You see, now it does do several things. There's several reasons God gave the law, but one of the reasons he gave it is Romans 3 verse 20 here, so that we might become conscious of our sin. You see, the problem is that most people, especially people who think they're saved by their works, they've never stopped to consider why God gave his law. Negatively, God gave us his law. He never gave it to save us. It wasn't given to be a means ever in which we could be right with God. You see, that's the way that I used to think. I used to think, well, God's law, he gave it to us, and you better do it if you want to go to heaven. That's why he gave us God's law. Well, Paul says he gave it. So one of the reasons is we can be conscious of our sin so that we can be made fully aware so that God can show us of our need of a Savior, that we this is his perfect law, and yes, he demands it, but we can't keep it, and we don't keep it. Here, listen to what he says in Romans chapter 3, 8, 8, beginning with verse 3. This is a phenomenal passage. For what the law was powerless to do, there's something that the law cannot do, Paul says. What is that anyway, Paul? He says, because it was weakened by the flesh. The fault wasn't in the law. The fault was in us. God did it. You see, we couldn't do it, so God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So you see, the law can't do some things. It, it can't save us. And the reason it can't save us, it can just tell us what God's perfect law is. But after we break it, it can't save us. Then it condemns us. And so what the law couldn't do, save us, God did. And he did it by sending his son. The problem wasn't that the law is bad. In fact, Paul will say in Romans 7 verse 12, the law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. The, law, the problem is not God's law. The law is our sinful nature the weakness of our flesh, the fact that every one of us has broken God's law, and now the law is against us. We're under a curse. We're under the penalty of the law now. And so you see, God never gave the law to us to save us. So why did God give us the law? Well, look back at Romans 3 verse 20, that first verse there, he says, so that we might become conscious of sin, to give us a knowledge of sin to define sin clearly, to show us that we're sinners, to show us that we cannot be justified by keeping God's law, but to condemn us. He gave us the law to condemn us, to, to let us see our guilt, our, the lostness, our horrible plight, and to stop our mouths. You see, that's what he says in, um, uh, in verse... Uh, 19 actually of Romans chapter 3 verse uh, in Romans chapter 3 he said so that every mouth may be silenced and he put it this way in chapter 5 and verse 20 the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase but where sin increased grace increased all the more what God gave us the law so that we sin would increase. Well, then Paul just gleefully adds, where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. It hyper abounded is actually what he's saying. It's hyper grace. It's over and above anything that, you know, was against us. But the purpose of his law was that sin might increase. How is that? By pointing out our sins by putting a spotlight on our sins to divide to define sin more clearly for us to expose us of our sins you see 
to expose the depravity of our heart. And, and that, by the way, causes us to sin even more. You think, how, how could being told God's law cause us to sin more? Well, listen to what Paul says. Paul says, in this passage right here, um, the longest passage there, that third uh, bullet point there on down, he says, what should we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. There's nothing wrong with God's law. It's perfect. Nevertheless, he says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. You see, the sin, the law helps us understand what sin is. He says, for I would not have known coveting. He gives us an example. Uh, really was. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing, it's, it's the weakness of our flesh. Remember that? Romans 8 there earlier. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. Apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I used to think I was hunky-dory. Then all of a sudden the law pointed out, you're, you're sinning when you do that. He says, verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. So then the law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. But did that which is good then become uh, uh, death to me? He says, by no means. Uh, nevertheless, in order that sin might become exceeding sinful, uh, that it might be recognized as sin. So do you see the, uh, the point that Paul is making? So this is a quick. Uh, summary the law in itself is good it's holy there's nothing wrong with god's law but due to the depravity the corruption of our human heart when the law demands something it exposes people's sin but more than that it stirs up evil passions in our hearts to sin even more you see people, some people think well if you're saved by grace you'll sin even more that is not true. When you're saved by grace, you will not want to sin. God will give us his Holy Spirit and he will convict us and lead us. And we, we will not want to sin against God's love. But the exact, exact opposite is true. Before you become a believer, before you're saved by grace, you, you've got to be saved by works. Well, you haven't kept those works. And when God uh, tells you what his law is and clearly defines it, it arouses this passion for you to sin even more it stirs you stirs up more sin and he gives two examples here coveting he says not to covet here you see so that goes further than just keeping some outward action but it goes to the attitudes of the heart coveting is a matter of the heart you see it produced all kinds of evil desire within him when he found out the command was don't covet because that's the, that's the reaction of a depraved, corrupt heart. When you have God's law presented to you, it encourages you to sin even more. And that's why works, that's another reason why works-based religions never work. People can be real dogmatic, but you know all they're doing is causing people to sin even more. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose there's a teenager. No bad desire, desire in the teenager's heart. Goes out to get the mail. No de bad desire. Just thumbing through the letters on his way back into the house or her and sees this one that says, for parents only. And suddenly, that teenager that had no desire to read that card all of a sudden has a desire to read that card. Now, were the... Were the words on that card sin? No, of course not. But those words stirred up this desire that was dormant in his heart anyway, you see. Um, I remember when I used to teach at school in the restrooms, they used to put in there, don't write and mark up the windows of the mirrors. 
Well, <laughs> every time you went in there, they were all marked up and scratched up. They had a sign that said, don't do it. Well, I told them, you need to take that sign down because you're just get, putting the idea in people's uh, minds. That's why I wouldn't be for sex education. You know, um, you put it in their minds and they'll have sex. It, you might say, well, it's safer. Well, yeah, but you're encouraging immorality, which is damaging to people's souls. You see, they need something more than that. They need something that will... Uh, help them on the inside, and the only thing that can do that is the gospel. And John Bunyan, in his book, uh, Pil Pilgrim's Progress, captures this idea perfectly. He said Christian, the main character of Pilgrim's Progress, was taken to the interpreter's house, and the interpreter showed all these rooms. Those rooms represented things that Christians need to know. They're basic things that we must know. But then uh, the interpreter took Christian to this large parlor and it was just covered with dust. It had never been swept. Then the interpreter called for a man to come in and sweep the room. Well, they, the, the man stirred up so much dust that it was just choking. You couldn't hardly breathe in the room. And then the interpreter told that man to stop and brought in another servant, a damsel, to put water on the room and then sprinkle water on the room and then sweep the room. And then that's what happened. There was no dust stirred up, water was sprinkled in the room and then they swept the room and it was fun. And the interpreter said, this is what it means. The parlor represents the unconverted person's heart. That's never been saved, never been sanctified by the grace of God's good news. And the, the, the dust was the sin in that unsaved person's heart. And that man who first swept was the law. That's what the law does. It stirs up all this corruption that's in people's hearts. It's dormant there, but now it gets stirred up. And the damsel who came in with water and sprinkled it with water and then swept is the gospel, you see. So. What was the effect of the, um, the, the dust uh, being swept by the man? Well, it chokes you, you see. And um, that's what happens. Sin, when it's revived, it increases and causes us to sin. Paul says here in Romans 7, even more. And so that's what he means when he says it, is, it uh, makes us conscious, that first verse up there, of sin. But... When we become conscious of sin by God's law, that opens the way for the good news of the gospel. That's why Paul would say after Romans 3, verse 20, in the next verse, he says, but now there's a righteousness of God. You can't keep God's law. You never have. I've been showing you for three chapters. There's no one righteous, not even one. All have sinned. All have fallen short. But now there's a righteousness from God, and it is for everyone who believes. It's given freely to everyone who believes. That's the purpose of the law, to stir people up, to see you haven't kept God's law, you can't keep God's law, and you need righteousness that you don't have. It exposes our depravity. And so Paul would say this, this is the reason we preach God's law. He says the goal or the aim of the law is Christ. When we preach the law to people, it points them to Christ. They need a savior. I really can't save myself. I need help. Let me give you an example like this. Um, and if, if you don't preach the law, people never really see the good news of the gospel. What if I went up to Dana, my wife? And I told her, Dana, I've got good news for you. Great news. I was online and I registered for some um, uh, free facelift. I got a coupon so that you can get a free facelift. You can go there and get this free facelift. Well, do you think she would accept that joyfully? Do you think she would think that was good news? You see, she doesn't need a facelift. She's never thought she needed a facelift. 
And if you went up to someone who never has thought they needed a facelift and you said, hey, listen, I've got a few uh, free coupon for you to go get a free a facelift. Not only would they not like it, they'd probably get mad. They wouldn't receive it with joy. They'd probably be upset. He thinks I need a facelift. But what if someone, you know, in Africa, some poor village, they had a deformed face and they needed a facelift. And you went up to them and said, here is a free coupon for you to get a facelift. Now, this facelift could correct all the deformities. Well, that would be good news because they couldn't afford a facelift and they needed a facelift. Do you see why the gospel, we have to preach God's law? Because until people understand you're not keeping God's law, you can't keep God's law. You're under the penalty of God's law. All God's law does is condemn you and curse you to an eternal hell. Then when you come with the good news of the gospel, it's good news. But you know what? What people are doing today, they're just telling people, hey, here's good news. Jesus died for your sins. Well, great, but I don't think I'm that bad of a person. I, I try pretty good. I think most people think I'm a, you see, and it's not good news to them at all. And, you know, people might obey rules. People might say, oh, well, if, if that's what I have to do on occasion, you say, if, if I didn't go to hell, you mean if I went to church and did those things, I'd go to heaven. Okay, I can do that. I'll, I'll be baptized and go to your church. You can talk people into that, although it's rare. The Hindus are saying you you got to follow their idea on how to get to heaven. And the Muslims are saying, no, you got to follow our ideas on how to get to heaven. And the Jews are saying, no, you got to become a Jew and do what we say to get to heaven. And Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons and Church of Christ, they're all saying, no, here's, here's what you got to do to get to heaven. They're all works-based religions. But what the gospel says is you can't do it. You have never done it. You're under a curse, but I got good news for you. Christ has done it for you. All you are going to contribute to your salvation is your sin. And that's what people have to, to embrace. And by the way, you know, people criticize sometime, uh, sometimes uh, uh, prison conversions. You know, you know why there's more prison conversions than anyone else? is because they realize they're sinners. And you go in there with the good news of the gospel, and it's good news to them. You, you talk to people out in the world, your neighbors, a lot of times, and they don't see themselves as being bad at all. And, and they've never felt the weight of their sin. They've never been confronted with God's law. And so that's why a lot of people can go to church that have never been converted. They've been dunked in water. They go to church. They think because I go to the right church and I do church right and I, I live a pretty good life, I'm saved. But you, you know what they are not saying? Christ has done it for me. Man, I'm a sinner. I'm under the, I was under the curse of the law. I was, I was condemned to an eternal hell. But Christ did something for me and he gave it to me. And I didn't do a single solitary thing. All right, so let's look at some applications of our teaching today. We've looked at some, but let's look at some. Uh, first of all, can you see the importance of preaching God's law? Can you see what I'm saying? This is really important. This is why I teach the Ten Commandments. You see, you have to teach God's law to show people you can't keep God's law. You never have. Now you're under a curse. And that's why it's important because it leads us, Paul says, it is the end or the goal. It points us to Christ. That's the goal of it, teaching the law. And um, there's nothing more important than that, you see. So how can I be right? I'm under the wrath of God. How can I be right? I'll, I'll tell you what, 
every great revival, you, you look at any great revival in the United States or Europe, Britain, all of these places, China, anywhere you look at where the greatest revivals that you can read about in history took place. And every one of them, they, they would begin by preaching God's law and, sh and confront people with their sins. In fact, if you read missionaries, there, uh, there was a missionary by the name of John Patton, famous uh, missionary. He went to the, uh, preach the gospel to the uh, cannibals in the South Sea Islands. And you know what the first thing he taught them is? He taught them the Ten Commandments. Did he think the Ten Commandments could save those cannibals? No, he didn't think that at all. And you can go to, uh, there was a John Elliott who was a great missionary in New England and he went to the Indians and the first thing he did, not, he didn't give them John 3.16. He gave them the Ten Commandments. He translated, the first thing he translated in their language was the Ten Commandments. You know why? Did he think that uh, the Ten Commandments could save them? No. But you see, John 3.16 wasn't going to ever make sense to them or be good news to them unless they understood you haven't kept the law. William Tyndall, uh, who translated the Bible that we know as the King James Version, a lot of people think, you know, it. He didn't translate it. He actually translated it and was revised and became the King James Version later, but about 93% of it's still his. He, he says, he, he taught, this is 500 years ago. He said, uh, the good news message of the gospel first comes through the teaching of the law. You have to bring people to a knowledge of their sins. And then after the law kills them, you see, the gospel makes them alive. And that's what Paul says in Romans 7, by the way, that the law kills. And uh, Spurgeon, and he preached before 10,000. Many people came to faith in London 150, almost 200 years ago. And he understood, you got to preach the law. They're never going to enjoy the gospel or never accept the gospel until they are convicted of their sins. You could go on and on. You see, until people are brought to a conviction of their sins, the gospel will not be good news. And that's why uh, a, a lot of people today, you hear them, they just invite people to church or they tell them, you know, here's what you can go to heaven if you do this. But they're not preaching, preaching the law. The next thing I want to look at as far as application is I want I want to ask you these questions at the very beginning. Again, I want you to think about them again. Think about your answer. You see, because this is an answer. This provides a test as to whether you are a true believer or not, whether you un even understand the gospel. You see, one of the purposes of the gospel is, to sh is that our mouths may be stopped. Romans 3, verse 19. In other words, it, it looks like a court. it's a courtroom. It's a picture of a courtroom Paul's giving us where you got a tape over someone's mouth, the defendant has nothing to say in their defense. That's one of the purposes God gave the law. So let me ask you, what are three to five reasons? What did you think are reasons why you will go to heaven? And when you think of someone you think is probably in heaven, what were the reasons you think that they're in heaven? Well, let me give you the correct answer, okay? So, so let's look at the correct answer. Christ's righteousness. This is why I'm saved. Christ's righteousness was given to me as a free gift. I didn't give him any reason to give it to me. It was grace. And it's grace alone. And I received it by faith. I have faith in the work and the life that Jesus did for me, and it's got nothing to do with what I've done. And that's the answer for number two. If you had five answers, that's that would be the answer for number two, three, four, and five. And if you've been thinking about someone, you think, well, they're in heaven. Let me tell you, if you said anything except they're in heaven because what Christ did for them, then not there's not a single solitary thing they did to get them to heaven. I don't care how nice you think they were. I don't care how nice you think. Well, my parents are really wonderful people. They were good parents. That didn't get them to heaven if they're in heaven. 
I'm not concerned about, I'm not making a judgment on them. My, what I want to do is expose your understanding of the gospel. Do you understand that you and anybody else who is saved is going to be saved and it's not going to be because of anything that you do or they have done. It will be solely because your faith and trust is on the work and life of Jesus, what he did for you, the righteousness of God, that's the very righteousness of Jesus Christ that was earned and given to you as a free gift. Has your mouth been stopped, you see? Or have you said, well, I go to church, I'm a good person, I'm a good parent. I, has your mouth been stopped? Has it caused you to see, like that tax collector, that you stand guilty before God? You don't have any defense. If you were killed in a car accident today, you would be standing before God. And if God asks you this question, why should I allow you into heaven? What right do you have to enter? What would your answer be? What would you say? Well, I went to the right church. I did church right, God. I want to tell you, you won't have an answer. Your mouth will be stopped at that point. But you're not, your mouth is going to have to be stopped either now and accept Jesus alone, his gift of grace, or it's going to be stopped when you die and stand before God. You won't have a defense. And so that's very important that you understand the gospel. And that's why I ask those questions. And then the last thing I want to say is this. You need to count the cost. Because um, when you die, you're going to need this message. And, and you need to accept it today. But you need to count the cost. You think, well, I'm. You know, I, I, I realize I need the good news, but I'm going to wait. I'll wait right before I die. And, um, and then I'll, I'll put my faith in Jesus alone. But right now I'll go to, you know, my church and enjoy the social benefits or continue my life living for myself, whatever. But before I die, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You may, you may not have an opportunity. It, it's like jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. You might think, well, the ground is a long ways off and I'm going to wait to the, you know, pretty close to earth before, because I really enjoy this until I pull the cord. But I'm going to tell you something about jumping out of a parachute. Your, your eyes don't adjust as fast as you're going down. And, and, and they say, I've never, I would never do it, but they say that your eyes don't adjust fast enough and you think you're farther away from the ground than you actually are. And some people have waited too long and they've hit the ground and died. And that may happen to you spiritually. You may try to wait, but guess what? It may be too late. There's no, there's no reason to wait, but I will tell you, you need to count the cost because I'm not gonna tell you, you're not gonna be persecuted. Paul says, through many hardships, we must enter the kingdom. Paul would say in Romans 8, verse 17, now if we are children, we are heirs. You see, we have an inheritance coming. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That's unreal. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. A lot of people preach about heaven, but I'll tell you what, they don't point out the fact that first of all, you have to share in his sufferings. Jesus would often talk about that the, you know, on the way to Emmaus, he told those two disciples on the way to Emmaus that he explained to them that he must, the Christ and the sign must first suffer and then enter into glory. Well, that's what Paul's saying here. And then Paul would say in the next verse, I consider um, our present sufferings to not be worth, uh, not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, the glory will be great. It will be eternal glory. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to be a believer, you're going to suffer. Paul would say in, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, all who live godly lives will suffer persecution. He didn't say most or some. He said all. He would say in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, rejoice and be very, very happy. 
because great is your reward in heaven. Because in the very same way, that's the way they persecuted the preachers in the Old Testament. You see, they lied about them. They opposed them, put them to death. And so you have to count the cost. But I will tell you, a lot of people don't have the courage to be saved. Because you're going to be persecuted. People understand, man, I'll lose my family. My spouse may not go with me. My kids, my parents, my friends, they'll ostracize me. People understand when you start counting the costs, there's going to be some things to pay. And I don't know if I want that. And, and they actually, intellectually, they understand the truth, but they never accept Christ in their heart. And I will tell you about cowards. Paul, uh, in Revelation 21, verse 7, there's going to be, in hell, there's going to be murderers and immoral people and thieves, the worst people for an eternity. But you know, in that list, you read that list, and all liars, every liar is going to be there. But I'll tell you, there's something else that you need to know about who's going to be in that eternal punishment. Cowards. Cowards. You see, a lot of people are cowards. And they're, they're not willing to suffer for Christ. But that's what we must do to enter into glory. First comes the suffering. We walk the same lowly path that Jesus walked. And then comes the glory. So. I pray that this lesson will have a great impact on your, uh, your life. I, I, and last Sundays as well, I, I pray that these sermons will affect you. and You will accept the gospel, the good news. This is great news, folks, the great news of the gospel. May God bless you with obedience to his gospel.